Hello and what is up YouTube? My name is G3Iron and today we are continuing our series on Magic Colors Abridged. Today we're taking a look at green magic, all of the core themes, core mechanics, as well as some of the core cultural icons that have inspired the design behind cards in Magic the Gathering that are themed with green colored magic. So for those of you that don't know, I got started in Magic way, way long time ago, over two decades ago, uh, when I first opened up a uh, starter deck, a blue starter deck at Scout Summer Camp. We were all bored and got into Magic that summer. I then stopped playing and have not played for almost two decades until some uh, patrons and some friends had said, hey, Magic the Gathering Arena is coming out and it'd be a great way for you to get into Magic. So I've been playing Magic for the last couple of months and been teaching my kids about Magic. So I figured, well, if I'm learning about Magic, and I'm teaching my kids about magic, one of the great ways that I can share that passion for the game and with my kids is through making some magic-themed lore abridged videos. So today we're taking a look at green magic. If you want to take a jump around to a particular section of the video, the table of contents with timestamps is listed above. So green magic, what's green magic all about? Well, today we're going to take a look at green magic's core identity, including its goals, its methods, its passions, its detractors, its allies, its enemies, its strengths, and its weaknesses weaknesses in terms of gameplay and overall theme. Then we're going to talk a little bit about cultural icons that reflect Green Magic's identity, as well as the hallmark mechanics of Green Magic. Then we'll get into some examples of standard legendary creatures and planeswalkers. If you're wondering why it is that I have uh, slightly leaning in terms of my card choices and discussion topics towards Magic the Gathering Arena, and it seems like I'm talking more about recent things rather than the sum totality of the rich history of Magic the Gathering, it's because I'm rather recent myself, and I'm learning all of this stuff myself, and I want to share that, what I'm learning with you. Lastly, we'll have some questions for discussion. I always love it when you guys have feedback and drop comments. It's great to be able to be involved in a community like that where we can chat about things back and forth. It's one of the things that I've really appreciated about being a part of the G3 community over the years. And so I look forward to chatting with some specific topics and some, dis some specific discussion questions focused on green magic with you all here today. So green, green magic, the way of nature, what's it all about? Well, green magic's goal is to nurture growth throughout the whole world. You can really boil down all of green to just this, growth, growth, natural growth. What a beautiful thing it is from green's perspective to have natural growth. Because of this, green has got a goal wherever it goes to see life uh, flourish. And this includes actually death. They want to see death flourish. Now, you might be thinking that sounds kind of weird. We'll get to some distinctions between the way how green wants to see life flourish and see death flourish than maybe the difference between black and the way that black wants to see life flourish and death flourish. But green has an appreciation for all things living as well as for all things dying in their natural, uh, regular uh, life and death cycle throughout the world. They want to see life grow. They also want to see the status quo be maintained. So Mark Rosewater, one of the lead developers at Wizards of the Coast, he's been there for over 20 years working and developing uh, cards and doing research for Wizards of the Coast for Magic the Gathering. He's got this wonderful, brilliant phrase about uh, green magic where he, had, he notes that every other color in magic wants to change the world in some way. They've got a goal and they want the world to change. Green magic, part of its uniqueness and the unique core identity of green is that green doesn't want to change the world. Green wants the world to be exactly the way as it was in its original intended state in its natural state and so because of this green has got some methods for accomplishing that goal green's methods rely upon instinct upon primal animal instinct upon natural reactions and natural growing actions out of similar consequences and scenarios so green loves to use creatures green loves to use them whether they are small little tiny one ones and little tiny tokens all the way from the smallest of insects insects that are present inside the magic world all the way up to the largest most greatest creatures dinosaurs and even bigger massive ancient creatures that the world has not seen for eons green magic wants to use creatures and they've got a wide menagerie of creatures to be able to pull from 
They've got the single most amount of creatures out of all five of the colors in Magic the Gathering. They rely on creatures to accomplish their goals of seeing the world grow. They also rely on overwhelming forces of nature, whether you're thinking about earthquakes, whether you're thinking about sandstorms, whether you're thinking about mudslides, whether you're thinking about floods. When you are thinking about the overwhelming strength and force of nature, what you and I, if we've got insurance policies often call as act of god clauses well in magic we would simply call them act of green clauses because they're acts of mother nature as it were acts of nature as they interact and destroy and seek to accomplish their goals of destroying things which are unnatural in order to allow the natural part of life to grow throughout the world so the way of nature has some passion. Green's passions are community. They've got a, a wonderful sense that everything in a particular environment and in a particular ecosystem has got a purpose and a place that relates to both the thing that's hunting as well as the thing being hunted, that everything has a purpose in nature, in its hierarchy. They're also very spiritual. Green is very, very spiritual. So have you ever heard that phrase, uh, not religious, but I am spiritual? Well, white would come across and white would say very religious, whereas green comes across and says not organized, not religious, but very spiritual, very connected with uh, otherworldly things that are yet of this world as it were, to turn a phrase. So spiritualism is a big part of green. Growth. We've talked about growth and seeing the things grow, but magic is really, really passionate about growth in green. Those of you that have played green decks before, you might be thinking about ramp decks, decks that quickly access their mana and their resources to be able to quickly get out larger and larger things, larger and larger creatures, larger and larger artifacts, larger and larger threats, larger and larger win conditions. That's all predependent, predisposed towards growth. You've got to be able to grow very, very quickly or grow steadily into something large and massive and also natural. And so green is very, very focused on growth. We'll talk more about that once we get to the hallmark mechanics of green. But I can't leave it out. That is green's passion. It is to grow. Green's got some stuff that it despises, though, some things that stand in its way. The, the first thing being constructs, whether those are man-made constructs, whether those are even some sort of magical constructs. If it is constructed by something that is other than Mother Nature, Green wants nothing to do with it and wants to get rid of it very, very quickly. This also applies to artifacts, which a wonderful example of this, if you could almost think of the sword in the stone, the Arthurian legend of pulling the sword out of the stone. If you have that image in your mind, right, of Arthur pulling the sword out of the stone, you can almost repurpose it in this discussion of magic, of green magic, as though the stone itself has gone up to grab this artifact, this ancient sword, this artifact, and is trying to swallow the sword and pull it down, down deep into the ground and then crumble it so that way it can become part of the dust and the natural life cycle of the rock itself, right? So green despair despises constructs, it despises artifacts, and it does everything within its natural powers and natural means to get rid of them. Naturalize is a wonderful card that's an example of that, that destroys a target artifact or enchantment. And green's got a ton of that inside the color. Also, green despises the unnatural. We'll get more into this as we're chatting about enemies, but for now, I'm just going to say, if it's a reanimated living thing, green hates it because green appreciates the natural life and death cycle of things. So anything that brings something that was dead back to life, that's not natural. It's not cool with green. Hint, hint, green hates black. All right, let's continue. Green's allies are white and red. Why? Well, to put simply, white and green both find common values in the community. So while white looks at the community and sees order and structure and sees a value in that, green, look, green looks at the community and at an environment and sees that the group and everything going on inside that environment is more important than the individual things going on in the environment. So you might look at something like a food chart right, where uh, one particular creature eats another particular creature, which eats another particular creature, which eats another particular creature. White can appreciate the order and the structure of this. Green looks at it and says, hey, this is just natural. This is the way things are in this particular environment. Well, green and white can both agree and get along on that. Both green and white also believe that the hierarchy of nature lends itself to this order. So some things are stronger than others, and green's okay with that, whereas other colors are looking to create balance or create equality or create some sort of uh, countermeasure to something that's larger than something else. Green doesn't care about that. Green says, whoever has the biggest creature ought to win the fight. 
That's Green's philosophy. None of this counter magic stuff, none of this creature removal stuff, none of this tricksy, you know, subliminal messaging sort of stuff, none of this behind the back sort of wise, cunning, cunnery. Green wants nothing to do with that. Green simply wants dinosaurs to be able to crush other stuff. They want primal animals to be able to crush non-primal animals. They want ferocious tigers to eat antelopes. They want antelopes to eat grass. They want this life cycle to continue, this hierarchy to prevail throughout the world. They want the natural hierarchy of nature to grow throughout the world. White and green can both agree on that. White and red find common values of emotion. While red is the ultimate emotion faction, green actually sees and appreciates some of this. So both red and green value biological, natural instincts. So while red says, I want to run rampant, I want to be free because that's what I want to do, green looks at that and goes, well, your biology says you want to be free, so okay, that sounds pretty natural. Go do that. That sounds great. So red and green can both find common values when it comes to biological emotional responses. Both red and green also recognize a need to exterminate opposition in a ruthless and aggressive fashion. So just because green is natural does not mean they're a bunch of uh, pacifist hippies right? They might be tree huggers, but these are the sorts of tree huggers that also might get stomped on because the tree was an ent and the tree was like, look, you're in my way. Get out of the way. You're unnatural. You evil, wicked human that destroys the forest. Green would look at that and say, it's okay. That's totally fine for the ent to be doing that. The ent is operating out of its natural biological instincts to be ruthless and aggressive in the expansion and growth of the forest. Green is totally fine with that. Both red and green can share in this ruthless and aggressive way of dealing with threats. Well, green has got some enemies. Who are green magic's enemies? Well, first off, blue. Blue is a threat to the way things are. Blue is all about learning. Blue is all about knowledge. Blue is all about the future. Blue is all about what you can become. Blue is all about potential. Blue is all about changing the world as it is to becoming the world that blue wants it to be. Green looks at this and says, no, 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 this is unnatural. This is not the way things ought to be. So blue's desire to change everything about the world threatens green's approach and primary goal of seeing growth in the status quo of nature. Blue also values artificial constructs, which challenges green's appreciation of the untouched world. Blue has got so many different artifacts, so many different enchantments, and so many different constructions, additions, man-made, as it were, additions to the world. Green looks at that and goes, I'm trying to get rid of all this stuff. I'm trying to keep it natural in here, man. And here you are, you're coming in here and messing with everything. Blue and green do not get along. Blue and black are both enemies of green. Why? Well, blue because they want to change the way things are, and black because they want to change the way things are in the life and death cycle. Black has got a disrespect for the way that death ends life and can then relive it again. Green hates this. Green thinks it's totally okay for a creature in a given environment to die as long as dying in that environment is a part of the cycle of growth. Black, however, does not see death in this way. Black values reanimation and necromancy. This is an abomination from Green's perspective. It's unnatural and it must be stopped. Black also values the self over the community, and so Black's values of serving self and practicality to the ruthless pragmatic extent, when compared with Green's mantra of symbiosis and we're all in this together sort of thing, they don't match up. They make for perfect enemies, Black and Green. Well, green magic has got some strengths. What are the strengths of green? Well, it's got a multitude of creatures. It's got the most creatures out of any color in all of magic. It's also got strength in ancient evolution. So we see a card right above me here, Titanic Growth. Green plays all sorts of cards which can transform the strength and power and abilities of your creatures over the course of a game. Green grows and uses its knowledge of what was to change and maintain the way things are, changing other people trying to change the way things are. Green wants to keep that status quo and will use all of its biological, ancient, evolutionary resources at its disposal to keep the status quo maintained. Green magic does have some weaknesses, though, and there's a couple of them. 
First off, green's got a soft heart for creatures, even if they're from an enemy force. So you notice in green, a lot of the cards inside green don't deal directly with removal of enemy creatures. They simply won't do it. Because in green's philosophy and from green's perspective, the biggest creature on the field ought to be the hunter, and smaller creatures are the prey. So if an opponent plays a bigger creature than you and you can't take it out, that's natural. That's nature. You're now a part of the regular old life cycle of this environment. Get ready to get eaten. That's Green's philosophy on things. So it's got a soft heart for creatures and has a problem with removing them, except with its own creatures. Green can also be too trusting and subject to schemes or subtlety. So subtle craftiness is a problem inside green because green really doesn't want things to change. And so this forces green and puts a perspective on green where they can't necessarily think outside of the box or think of a way in which doing something might benefit an opposing viewpoint and harm their own. So green sometimes can fall for trickery and schemes, whether they be subtle or cunning in any fashion. Well, there are some iconic influences on green magic that we can think of. There are some here that we're going to take a look at from the Wizards of the Coast Research Department that they shared with us through a couple of different articles, which, of course, are linked down below in the description. I try to cite as much as I can. We're in the age of the Internet. We really ought to cite things uh, and where other people can go to either fact check us or just to learn more. So all that stuff is down below in the video description if you would like to read more about this. So here are some of these iconic influences on green magic as they were come up with by the uh, Wizards of the Coast dev team. King Kong, which, duh, right? King Kong just screams primal instinct, primal rage, the primal ultimate killer, the primal ultimate hunter, the primal ultimate survivor, King Kong. And much in the same way, Godzilla, right? Godzilla. Now, this one I wanted to take some exception with, just personally. Again, I didn't come up with this one. This was Wizards of the Coast R&D team. I wish I could have been there for this discussion because isn't Godzilla, at least according to some of the different lore of Godzilla, isn't he actually like a man-made construct or a biological product of a man-made construct? Anyway, leave me a comment down below. I could be wrong on that. I could, I need, I might need to brush up on my Godzilla lore. But Godzilla nonetheless represents a lot of things that Green values, the strongest, most primal creature being the dominant force in an engagement. Godzilla certainly represents that. Tarzan is another great example of the way of nature. Tarzan harmonizes with nature. Tarzan is the epitome of that not religious but spiritual dude that gets in touch with his inner animal, his inner beast, but that's also in touch with the rest of the world around him and knows his place. Hodor from Game of Thrones. This was one that was a real head scratcher to me. Um, so the reasons listed by Wizards of the Coast R&D uh, was that he acts out of emotion um, a lot of the time. So he's very, very emotional. He's big, he's strong, and he acts off of his instincts. And he's very reactive. He's not always the most uh, well thought out or well planned um, individual, but uh, he definitely is reactive. And he definitely uses his reactions uh, and his emotions, his instincts, to gauge the rest of the world around him. So I guess that fits pretty decently. But I wanted to try and think about things that weren't just like big dumb stuff right like there is it is possible for green to be somewhat aware of its surroundings and wise and ancient things are aware of that well getting on to our next one talking about things that are wise daryl from the walking dead i loved this example daryl sees the zombie apocalypse in the walking dead as just the new way of life. This was a great example of that, that green represents and sees the world the way it is and doesn't want to change it. Daryl sees the zombies as, hey, this is just the way it is now, man. We got to deal with the zombies. Like, we shouldn't be too worried about philosophizing whether or not we can change the zombies or change the outbreak. Like, what we need to do is rea realize the new biological environment that we're in, which includes and factors in zombies. So, great example of some real pragmatic wisdom from Daryl. Thanks so much to uh, Mr. CSAP, to uh, Beckett, and to Mrs. Draconis for a couple of suggestions down below because I was having a really hard time coming up with anything. So thanks uh, to everybody for helping me with these next couple of ones. And then, of course, if you've got some icons that you would like to contribute or that come to your mind as you're thinking of green, feel free to drop us a comment down below. I love reading that stuff. So a couple of suggestions were Mowgli, which this was brilliant. Mowgli from the Jungle Book. A lot of uh, similarities between Mowgli and Tarzan, although I would make one distinguishing remark between Tarzan and Mowgli. I mean, you could say that Tarzan is just Mowgli grown up, but one of the key distinctions between Mowgli and Tarzan, Mowgli, like at the end of the Jungle Book, I'm talking about the, the old uh, 60s or 50s uh, Jungle Book cartoon, 
from Disney is that eventually Mowgli goes and sees and finds his place as he chases the girl at the very end of the movie. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. Jungle Book spoilers from 60 years ago. He goes and he follows the girl into the village, right? That is a great example, actually. You might be thinking, oh, no, that's not, that's not green at all. That's counter green. It's, it's civilization. It's unnatural. But actually, for Mowgli, it is natural. It's a recognition in the Jungle Book that he is not a bear. He is not a tiger. He's not a, a jaguar. He's not a monkey. He is a human, and he needs to go where the humans go, that this is the environment where he belongs that's most natural. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I thought that was a brilliant suggestion. Next up is Treebeard from Lord of the Rings, which this one like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, duh, why couldn't I think of Treebeard? Treebeard is like the quintessential fantasy figure that is green. He's all about the natural environment. He's all about keeping things the way they are. He is very, very patient, but also very, very wise, right? Everything that Treebeard does is for the benefit of his forest, of his creatures that are within inside his life cycle. And when things die, he goes... That's the way it goes. It's sad. We ought to be sad about it, but it's the natural part of life. Life happens, and so does death. Treebeard is a great example of iconic influences, cultural influences in uh, green magic. Thranduil, who is, of course, from The Hobbit uh, and is the dad of Legolas from Lord of, the Wing, Lord of the Rings, is another great example of somebody that wants to maintain the status quo, that doesn't want to get involved in other things or get tangled up in schemes or subtle cunning plans or get involved in the world at large. He's mostly non-interventionist. He says, like, hey, if the, if the war is going to come to us, then we'll get involved. But other than that, I'm hanging back. That's another great example of something that is very green, keeping things the status quo and maintaining peace to grow in the midst of that. And then lastly, Will Ferrell and Adam Sandler, because they value being the same character in every movie. They want to keep the status quo in every single acting movie and acting role that they take on. I thought that was a great suggestion, so I had to throw that in there. All right, so hipster eco hippies, is that what green is all about? Are they just a bunch of tree huggers? Are they simply pacifists? Are they simply uh, to get trodden over by the other four colors involved in magic? Well, let's take a look at a couple of quotes here from Mark Rosewater in an article that he wrote about green. Green is also t closely tied to the land. This help helps green in numerous ways. It allows green to find new connections faster and to accumulate mana at a swifter speed than the other colors. This allows green to both cast larger spells faster and to gain access to other colors of mana more easily. Green is also very connected to life itself and has the ability to rejuvenate. Tied closely to this is green's connection with growth, which can make use of which it can make use of to overwhelm others. Green's close bond with the natural order means that it can speed up natural processes that might normally take much more time. All of this, though, is green using the elements of nature as a means to show off what nature can do. Because, once again, green truly feels that the one thing keeping individuals from accepting the truth of the world is a lack of understanding. There's an inner harmony that's necessary in order to be able to take in all of what's around you. And Green works hard to allow individuals to tap into that harmony. That's from Mark Rosewater in, quote, It's Not Easy Being Green Revisited, which was posted in 2015, which was Mark Rosewater looking back at something that he originally wrote in 2003. Really awesome article if you want to take a look. And again, the link is down below in the video description. So the mechanics of nature. Let's talk really quickly about a couple of different mechanics that make green go inside the Magic the Gathering card game. So first off, reach. So green has got a lot of flying hate. Green's got the least amount of creatures that can fly, and therefore it's got the most flyer removal. It's got a lot of reach capabilities, reach being a keyword that allows the creature to attack something that is indeed flying. Green's also got a lot of enchantment hate. It's second only to white in removal, and that makes sense. Enchantments aren't normal, and so green wants to get rid of them. Thirdly, tokens. So green creates a lot of little things because there's strength in numbers. Green creates 1-1 one, one sapperlings. Green creates 1-1 one, one insects. Green creates 2-2 two, two wolves. And green creates 3-3 three, three beasts. Green's got a ton of token generation. 
Green also has got a lot of fight effects. These fight effects can be different from other factions and other magic types of fight effects in that it's targeted creature removal. So these fight effects will simply target one of the creatures that you have in front of you and pick another enemy creature and remove it that way. Remember how we said that green lacks the ability to simply magically remove enemy creatures? Green believes the biggest creature ought to win the fight. And so green wants to have the biggest creature on the board and will target that creature to fight your creature, hoping that green's creature always comes out on top. Green also has the Lure and Provoke mechanic, which is forces blocks out of opposing creatures. So because Green has got all of these awesome, massive, big creatures, one of the things to do to beat Green is to not interact with its creatures, because your creatures are probably going to lose out to Green's massive, big hunters. You're going to be prey and on the wrong end of the food chain. Well, one of the things that Green can do to get around somebody that's not willing to fight is simply Lure and Provoke them into combat. Green's got a lot of cards that allow them to force blocks blockers on opponents. Green also ramps up. We've been talking about it all video. This is the iconic mechanic, in my mind at least, of green to quickly acquire more available mana through several different means. Hexproof. Green also is hexproof. Our buddy right here, Carnage Tyrant, is hexproof. There are a number of creatures that are unable to be targeted by enemy spells. That is a creature with hexproof, and green's got a bunch of them. Green also has Trample. Our buddy up here, Carney T, Carnage Tyrant, also has Trample. It pushes through extra damage. So any remaining damage that would have been dealt to a creature gets put onto the face or other creatures that are being blocked by that creature. It's a great way to thematically express a massive dinosaur crushing a single soldier holding a spear. And he's just like, oh my gosh, and there's rah, dinosaur like eating the dude and then continuing on. It's not like the dinosaur eats the dude and then is like, oh yeah, I'm totally satisfied. I'm a 70 ton killing machine but one dude that weighs 180 pounds and totally satisfied me. No, the dinosaur is going to keep going, right? Trample is a great mechanically themed keyword for green magic. The next mechanic is that it can't be countered. Again, like Carney T, cannot be countered. These creatures that come into play, they're there. They're a part of the natural environment. You can't get rid of them. You can't deny them from being on the field because that would be unnatural. Green's got several different creatures that can't be countered. And lastly, Poison and Death Touch, which kills any creature that is dealt damage by the creature, is another mechanic that green takes advantage of to, once again, even if it's got smaller creatures, say, this is the little bit of trick that I've got in my particular uh, arsenal. Maybe it's a smaller creature that couldn't take down a larger hunter, a smaller prey, but the smaller prey might have some venom, might have some poison, might have something that even as you kill it might make it tough to digest. Green's got that going on with it as well. Well, there are some heroes in the forces of nature. Galta, the primal hunger. Goreclaw, terror of Kal Sisma. Grun, the lonely king. Marwyn, the, nurt the nurturer, being elves. Elves are very prevalent throughout green. Multani, uh, Yavamaya's avatar, is another legendary. And then two copies of Vivian as two different planeswalkers that are presently available inside green's legendary arsenal of creatures and planeswalkers. Well, what appeals to you about green magic? What does it feel like for you to play green? I'm wearing green here today, but on a day when you want to play green, what does that feel like to you? How would you describe that? When you log on to Magic the Arena or you build a paper green deck, what is it that you're feeling? What does it feel like to play green? And then next question, what tilts you playing against green? I can tell you one thing that tilts me playing against green. When it is turn one and I see that stupid little elf come down and I know that they're automatically going to have a turn three play on turn two and then if they play another elf and now they're going to have like okay they're going to have a turn five play on turn three ah uh, it's really really frustrating when you see things come out that simply change your expectations of the game green looks at it and goes this is natural you and i look at it and go i'm tilted concede <laughs> so what tilts you playing against green who do you see as iconic figures representing green magic's values? I tried to list a few of them, Mowgli being one of them, as well as Treebeard, but what are some iconic figures in your mind for green magic? Leave a comment down below and feel free to join the discussion. Here's all of our citations, which are also included in the video description down below. Thanks so much for watching, kids. If you're watching, thanks so much. Daddy looks forward to the next game of magic that we're going to play together, and I hope today is the day that you get to play green and you get to be the one to drop the elf on turn one and totally tilt your opponent with your amazingly awesome scary dinosaurs. <laughs>